Thank you, Deb. Here I was about to sit down. I kept wondering, are you finished yet? Are you finished yet? Are you finished yet? And then I... All right. Welcome. It is good to be back uh, with you all today. Uh, thank you for, uh, to everyone who held down the fort while Heather and I were on vacation, taking some uh, well-needed time off. And uh, thank you. It was, it was a wonderful service. I attended my live stream last week, so I got to experience things from the other end. Uh, and I enjoyed the service, and uh, it was really wonderful. So thank you to everyone who worked toward that. Uh, it was really, really a good worship service. So good morning, everyone. Like I said, welcome to worship. I'm Robert Roseberry, pastor here at St. Paul's, and I'd like to thank you for being here today, whether you're in person or in our online congregation, on this eighth Sunday after Pentecost, as we work with the spirit of Pentecost to be a Christian community that affirms God's love by transforming lives, connecting generations, impacting our community and world, and making disciples for Jesus Christ. For those of you in our sanctuary here today, please feel free to log into Facebook as you're uh, on your whatever device you may have with you today, uh, and connect and say hello to the folks on our live stream as we worship today. We want to make sure everybody feels connected uh, to worship, whether they're in person or online. And speaking of connecting over worship, if you're uh, new here today, whether you're out there or in here, uh, please go to spocala.org and fill out a visitor card and help us get to know you as you're worshiping here today with us. If you'd like to support God's work here at St. Paul's, you can go to supportstpauls.org and make your financial gift there using any of our secure giving platforms. So as we enter worship on these spirit-filled summer Sundays, we'll be working with the Holy Spirit to inspire and anchor us wherever we are physically as the church family of St. Paul's United Methodist Church. We're also working toward a wonderful celebration on August the 8th that I hope you'll mark your calendars for when we'll celebrate the return of the school year and our return to each other. We're also planning to do worship a little different starting that Sunday, so we hope you'll come and be a part of the fun. And this week, as we begin our series on Lamentations and lean into some difficult subjects, this is a good time to keep God's promise of presence firmly in mind. So let's affirm our faith using the affirmation of faith of the United Church of Canada found on page 883 of your hymnals if you have them with you today. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus, crucified and risen, our judge and our hope, in life, in death, in life beyond death. God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. In the year 587 before the Common Era, the kingdom of Judea ended when Jerusalem was conquered and destroyed by the Babylonian emperor Nebuchadnezzar. And when they left, oh, after Jerusalem fell, the leading citizens were exiled to Babylon, far, far away. And when they left, so did the cultural and institutional memory of the Jewish people. No more temple, no more synagogue leaders, no more rabbis and scribes, no more people to officiate and help celebrate the great holiday traditions of the Jewish faith. No one uh, to help people remind others or to remind others about their faith and who their God was and all that God had brought them through, which to the Babylonians was precisely the point. The book of Lamentations, according to most biblical scholars, was written in response to this historical tragedy or was inspired by it. Some scholars have also said, and tradition often postulates that the prophet Jeremiah could have written some or all of this book, although there's no direct evidence that he did. Its title in the Hebrew Bible is actually Echa, which is translated from the Hebrew to English as one word. How? You recognize the grief there? How could this happen? As we rush out of this pandemic, I'm well aware that it's the last thing we want to think about. After all, it's the middle of vacations. We want to get out. We want to see people we missed out on last year. But dealing with and naming the grief we've all experienced is what we must do during this time if we're to make a spiritually healthy transition and see this post-pandemic world with God's eyes 
It's the equivalent of eating our spiritual vegetables. And as you heard last week, church leadership has been praying over the question of how we can minister effectively in this new post-pandemic world. And as we all have these discussions together as a church family, practicing good grief is the first step in moving forward into God's future. So as we look at the book of Lamentations and learn about good grief, may the Lord be with you. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for this time together. You're present to us in times of sorrow as well as times of happiness. When we celebrate victory and blessing, and when we cry how in grief and distress. God, bend your ears to us and provide healing for our pain, wholeness for our sense of loss, and grant our souls to be still so we may remember that you are on our side always. May we listen to the word you have for us today. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, your presence with us, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Hello. Come right over here. And I'm going to have Ellie Joe help me today. So Ellie Joe is going to step up here. The rest have you right down there. And Dries, why don't you come up too? Might use you and maybe Ari. Max, you can come up too if you want. Everybody can come up. We're all kids in some way. 
Ellie's a little nervous because she's never sure what I'm going to do. But to make you a little more nervous, you better put these on, Ellie. There you go. Stick them on there, at least one of them. All right. Oh, they brought a bunch of them. You can do this. There you go. Stick that on there. You can do that. Oh, that takes up your whole arm. That's cool. Perfect size. Yes. I worked that out well. Bad staff work on that one. Okay. Well, today, we're going to talk about something that we've always heard about. I'm going to give you some sin. Okay? And what we're going to find out in our lesson today, that sin, so much Sin is a lot like slime. You know that? So if I were to tell you there was some money in that pink one, what would you do? Go ahead. Go for it. Stick it right down in there as far as you can. Yep, yep. Just hang on there for a while. All right. You're cool. It's cold. It's so cold. Oh, sorry about that. Okay, well, that's a new reaction for it, but we're good. All right, you just stay there for a while, okay? Now, the problem with slime is that slime is kind of like sin. Once you get, yeah, what did you say? It gets everywhere. Once you get involved with sin, you're dripping. Uh Uh-oh, see there, it drips. Once you get involved with sin and stay involved with sin, it kind of takes over your life. Just like if Ellie Joe were to try to pick up her hand right now, what would probably happen? Yeah, it comes right with her. It sticks right to you. There is really one way to get away from slime and sin, and that is through God and through Jesus. Because God tells us, yes, we can get out of sin. We can be forgiven. We can get past all that ugliness and all that sadness that sin often causes. Now, remember I said there might be some money in there, so she went right after it? Sometimes people tempt you with sin that same way. Actually, the money's in my pocket. Not in there at all. So don't let people deceive you into doing sinful things because you think there's a prize. Well, you might take that whole bucket home. It might be stuck on you the whole time. So... So please remember that, boys and girls. But there is a way out. Now, if I hold on to this glove, can you just pull your hands out of the glove? And with God, you can come out of sin perfectly clean. So boys and girls, remember, the Bible tells us you can be forgiven. Sin no more and follow God. Okay? So remember, sin is much like slime. It can stick to you, but God and Jesus is the way out of it. Got it? All right, let's head back down. Oh, let's say a prayer before we go. God, thanks for reminding us that you're there for us, that no matter when we step into the wrong areas, you are our way back. You can forgive us. You can help keep us from getting stuck in in slime and sin. And when we're sad, you are our way forward. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Now let's head down. disappointed Craig did Thank you, Craig. Thank you, kids. And uh, that's a good illustration. I was hoping he would write quick reads on the side of that pail so everybody could see it. As we enter our prayer time today, uh, we, I do want to make sure everyone knows here as we gather, uh, every week in our weekly mailer, we list prayer requests from the previous weeks that have been uh, turned in to us. So as we pause during the next few moments for a moment of silent prayer, let me invite you to say those names you're thinking of to yourself or out loud so we can all hear them. If you'd like to add a name to the prayer list, you can call or email the church and we'll get their name on 
for prayers in the next weekly mailer. You can also add a comment to the live stream today as we have our prayer time, and we'll add that name to our prayer list as well. Let's begin our prayers with the people as we pray together. Lord, you are our provider and the giver of every good and perfect gift. You know our grief and sorrows because you lived them yourself. As we read the words of the Bible, we read of people who, like us, suffered disorienting loss and expressed it to you in the powerful language of lament. You ask us to call on you each and every day to confess our needs and those of others. Today we lift up those whom we know need you in a special way. So let us pray for this time for all those who are grieving. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all those who are homebound or in care facilities. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We lift up all those who have ongoing and sustaining needs, especially the people of Grace Presbyterian Church. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of peace and hope, we are a people focused on activity and too afraid to sit and think. From every source, we have opportunities to go and see and do a host of activities, and we are engaging in them even more now because we missed them so much last year. They beckon us to come and have fun and forget some of the more unpleasant things we go through. But one of the most necessary activities we neglect is often our need for rest and, when appropriate, lamentation. We crowd each day that's been given by you as a blessing with busyness. We forget what it's like to sit and listen, to rest, to take time to reflect, and, if necessary, cry. Help us to find the quiet moments in which our souls can be made whole again, even if that journey to wholeness is made through grief and sadness. We've lifted before you this day names of dear ones for whom we have concerns. Let's turn these concerns over to you, Lord, for you are the master healer who restores our souls. Help us to lend an ear, a warm embrace, or a kind heart to those who come to us with needs. Help us to place our trust and our lives in your unending care. For we pray in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our first reading this morning comes from the book of Psalm, chapters 89. How long, O Lord, will you hide yourself forever? How long will your wrath burn like fire? Remember how short my time is. For what vanity have you created all mortals? Who can live and never see death? Who can escape the power of Selah? Lord, where is your steadfast love of old, which by your faithfulness you swore to David? Remember, O Lord, how your servant is taunted, how I bear in my bosom the insult of peoples, with which your enemies taunt, O Lord, with which they taunted the footsteps of your anointed. Blessed be the Lord forever. Amen and amen. The word of God for the people of God. Please feel free to sing along. Precious Lord. Take my hand, lead me on, let me stand. I am tired, I am weak, I am worn. Through the storm, through the night, lead me on to the light. Take my hand. Precious Lord, 
lead me home when my way grows drear precious Lord linger near when my life is almost gone Our second reading is from Lamentations, chapter 1. How lonely sits the city that once was full of people. How like a widow she has become. She that was great among nations. She that was a princess among the provinces has become a vassal. She weeps bitterly in the night with tears on her cheeks. Among all her lovers she has no one to comfort her. All her friends have dealt treacherously with her. They have become her enemies. Judah has gone into exile with suffering and hard servitude. She lives now among the nations and finds no resting place. Her pursuers have all overtaken her in the midst of her distress. And the second part, chapter 4. How the gold has grown dim how the pure gold has changed. The sacred stones lie scattered at the head of every street. The precious children of Zion, worth their weight in fine gold, how they are reckoned as earthen pots, the work of a potter's hands. Even the jackals offer the breast and nurse their young, but my people have become cruel like the ostriches in the wilderness. The tongue of the infant sticks to the roof of its mouth for thirst. The children beg for food, but no one gives them anything. Those who feasted on delicacies perish in the streets. Those who were brought up in purple cling to ash heaps. The word of God for the people of God. Praise be to God. So to help prepare for this sermon and to get an idea of some of your responses, I asked on Facebook, what were some of the things that we missed during the pandemic? And we also, what were some of the things that you really grieved now that things were beginning? What what do you realize that you lost? Um, I got a lot of interesting responses. Uh, People missed being with others. They missed seeing full faces. They missed hugs. They missed family gatherings. One person mentioned that they missed communion. That was something that a lot of churches decided not to do. We did not make that decision. And I didn't realize until months into the pandemic just how rare that was. There are many, many churches who decided if we can't do communion with each other in person, we're not going to do it. And uh, the person who replied was part of a church 
uh, that, was, that hadn't done communion since the pandemic started, and that was something they really missed while uh, during the pandemic. People missed seeing full faces. Uh, that was something I didn't realize that I missed until we all we began to take the masks off, and then I realized, oh my gosh, you folks look completely different. Um, and I realized how much I had missed it after we got it. Uh, now people seemed to be, oh, people also agree they missed family gatherings. That was something that uh, folks missed a lot of, or being with specific you know, family members that they hadn't seen in a while. Uh, people were grieving a loss of carefree socializing, a certain grieving a loss of a certain trust in others, missed opportunities for ourselves and for others, especially teachers M mention this all the time when I talk to them, and it was mentioned in the comments on Facebook. Uh, there's a loss, uh, there's also was a grief over a loss of people who make our lives better. And that was something that really resonated with me, something that really, um, that I gr am grieving over in the pandemic is, you know, every funeral that I did, but really, really grieving over the first person who died during the pandemic that I just still miss every time I walk into the office, and that's Marilyn Static. Um, I love all of you equally, but every time I walk into the office, I think she should be there. And so despite that being over a year ago and me doing a lot of funerals, that one really still sticks with me. And that's a, a particular person that I grieve over still as I walk in. And we're all in this spot where we're, we're, we should be saying, precious Lord, take our hands, lead us on, help us to stand so that we can get through this. Even though we are transitioning out of this time of pandemic, cases are still going up in our area and it's still going on. And so there's an, there's an element of, of grief and of a weird sticking point where we want to be out of the grief. We want to be out of this sense of loss and we want to be out of it, but we're not there yet. And if we're not careful, we can forget to do what God calls us to do during this time and what the Bible is full of, and that's just lament. Like I said, I know it goes counter to what we all want to do right now, but I thought, and, and as we were talking as a church leadership and trying to figure out um, where we're going to go next, you know, it struck me that before we really move into that future or we begin discussing it, it would be really good to spend some time to just say those things out loud to ourselves and among our church family. Gosh, I miss this. Like, I'm hurting that I didn't get this for a year or I still am trying to figure out how to do life without this thing that I lost during the pandemic. And that's what grief really is. It's, it's a simple thing, actually. It's very simple and it's also very, very tough as we go through it. It's simply an experience of loss. And it can be over anything. You grieve pets, you grieve people, you grieve losing a certain status. Maybe you also might grieve losing, a, a, you grieve losing a body part or your health. You grieve losing a toy as a kid <clears throat> and sometimes as adults. But you can grieve anything. And the stages of grief are often the same, whether it's a person or whether it's a thing or whether it's a, a, anything else. The stages aren't linear. We're going to talk more about that next week. But the stages of grief, we talk about them like they're stages you move through one at a time, but you don't. You can be in several at once. And it's also incompatible with what we often almost unconsciously do to grief is that we shame it into submission. When in reality, we got to let it out. And, and as I have done funerals over and over and over again, I get to see how people respond to grief. And, and I've seen a lot of different things happen. And, and, you know, people often try to think their way through it positive and say, well, I'll look at the positive and I'll look at that. And sometimes that does help. But often what it does is it tries to shrink the emotional response. Grief stinks. You're going to cry. You're going to ugly cry in the middle of a meeting or at lunch out of nowhere. You're, as a smell is going to pass through your nose and you're going to all of a sudden be reminded of that person you lost, and you're going to lose it. That's what's going to happen. And that's fine. That's what, that's what God has made us to do. That lamenting is what God has made us to do so that we can 
pass through the loss of something we love and hold dear and move into what is now our new normal. And the pandemic is no different. And Judah is a really good case study of a sad, powerful moment of grief. The word sad doesn't really even quite cover it. But part of what Judah is lamenting here, and by the way, the definition of lament is a passionate expression of grief or sorrow. It is emotional. It is senseless. It is painful. And it is something we have to go through. Lament is... As Judah, as Judah is going through this loss of Jerusalem, as the, the people of Israel are being scattered, as their leading citizens are being taken away, their, their culture, their identity, all of these people are being taken out of the country and moved to Babylon. And the people that are left, and there were people left, all of a sudden are leaderless. They're under Babylonian occupation. Their temple, the center of their faith, which was up on that hill in Jerusalem, Mount Zion, all of that has been wiped out. And they're they're homeless. They may have their houses still, but they are homeless. And they go through these words that we've heard already today. How lonely is the city that once was full of people? How the gold has grown dim? How it, all of these things that we hear in the book of Lamentations. And yes, in Lamentations there are beautiful words like the steadfast Lord of were, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases, his mercies never come to an end. But first, there is the lament that we read about today. I'll read it just quickly again. I know Malia did a great job before, but just so we can hear these words again. How lonely sits the city that was once full of people. How like a widow she has become. She that was great among the nations. Judah has gone into exile with suffering and hard servitude. She finds no resting place. Her pursuers have all overtaken her in the midst of her distress. How the gold has grown dim. The sacred stones lie scattered in the head of every street. And, and on and on and on. And this, this part really stuck, stuck at me as I read it. Verse 3 of chapter 4. Even the jackals offer the breast and nurse their young, but my people have, has become cruel like the ostriches in the wilderness. There's that sense of what was once nurturing and loving and life-giving has now become hard and dead. The tongue of the infant sticks to the roof of its mouth for thirst. Children beg for food, but no one gives them anything. That's lament. And if you feel like doing that over what our world has been through for the past year and a half, it's all right. And and really and truly, emotionally to do that, that's what allows us to move forward to the next phase. And I realize as I'm preaching this and as I was writing this sermon and trying to come up with how to approach this topic, how to move through it and how to end, I realized that especially as, as we have this hybrid format of live stream and in person, that there is no way to get through everything that we process here today. And so during this sermon series, and maybe afterwards, we'll see how it goes, um, at three o'clock on Sunday afternoons, so after the sermon, after you have some time to take a breath and have some lunch, um, we will go, I'll have a Facebook Live where we can come in and begin to process a little bit more. We can dig into the scripture a little more heavily than we do during the sermon, and we can kind of process some more. So I'll be on Facebook Live at three. You can join me on there, and we can process this some more. But as we, as we come into this picture of Judah in Lamentations, this, we can think of this, and we think we know what this may have felt like. It was, a, it was a punch in the gut. It was a slash through everything we had felt like. But this was also the ending, or could have been, the ending of an entire people, because Judah is the second one to fall. Several decades later, and hundreds, over a hundred years later, the empire of Assyria had come in and taken the northern kingdom and conquered it and sent all the inhabitants off into exile. And now they were seeing the same thing done to them. So not only were they grieving this loss of home and this loss of culture, they were grieving family members because they now knew that what had happened to those ten tribes up north was happening to them. And so it just compounded things. And as we lament together, be comforted because a lot of the Bible is lament. 
A whole lot of the Bible is like the stereotypical country song, only it doesn't include trucks. And if you read the Bible backwards, no, it doesn't work that way. But a lot of the Bible, a lot of the Psalms are lament. That, that beautiful hymn that we heard, Precious Lord, Take My Hand, that is biblical language. Because so much of the Bible deals with people who are people, who go through grief, who go through loss, who lament and go, how, Lord, has this happened? What in the world do I do now? And so that should tell us, and I think God is telling us through his word in the scripture, that lament is fine. If it includes yelling at God, getting angry at God, God understands and he's not threatened by that because there's plenty of that in the Psalms. There's plenty of people going, why God has this happened to me? How could this happen? How have you let me become so injured or so wounded? How in the world have you let this happen to me, God? That's in the Psalms, all over the Psalms. It's a 150-song country album. And so that should be our link. We should feel comfortable. And, and so many times in lament, and what do we hear? You'll, you'll get over it. Or this will pass. Or, hey, suck it up. Something like that. That that lament can't come out because it's either not appropriate or because it, it, it isn't the right place or because it's been too long. And as someone who lost my dad right after I turned, or when I was 26, I can tell you, it doesn't really go away. You still miss it. You still have times where you just have to lament. You still have to go, how? And it's only in doing that that we can find the strength to say, precious Lord, take my hand. I can't do this on my own. And God leads us through. God can help us time after time after time because it's a continual thing. God can help us not get over it, but go through it. And as I have done funeral after funeral after funeral, and I've seen families as they grieve, I've seen people try to medicate it away. I've seen people try to push it away and say, oh, it's a celebration of life. Those aren't bad words, but sometimes they miss the point, to be honest. Or say, oh, it's, it's not, we're, we're not, we're, he, they're not dead. They're, well, no, they're dead. Let's deal with the facts of it. But what do we do? We move toward God in those moments. Not toward positive thinking or trying to smile and get through it, but we move toward God. And I'll, and I'll tell you too, it's been the rare person that can stand up and say something about their loved one at a funeral and not cry. I'm going to give you all permission. Whenever I do anybody's funeral that you may know, if you stand up there and say something about the person and you're reliving memories and you ugly cry right up here, it's okay. It is not a performance. Neither is worship. If you ugly cry during worship because something hits you, a, something reminds you of somebody, that's good because you're getting it out in the best possible place as God is here and that cross is standing before us. That's the place to find that healing. And so how do we stand in that sorrow? Well, the first thing is we don't push grief away. We actually invite it in. And that's scary because we don't like that. We want to push bad stuff, what we feel is bad stuff, away. But instead, inviting it in is perhaps the best thing we can do. When I was a chaplain at Atlanta Medical Center back in seminary, I heard this great metaphor that really helped me get through these crazy situations as people would come into the emergency room or shooting victims or traffic victims or, or things, and I would have to figure out you know, I'm supposed to be a pastor right now, but I'm a human seeing this and I'm losing myself. As you take those emotions, you take those tears, you take that lament or that hurt, and you wear it like a sweater. Instead of throwing it, you wear it. And you say, this is me right now. This is where I am. And it's okay. And you take a deep breath. And with that emotion in your heart, 
you learn how to express it the best possible way in that moment. Because really what I found out is that that hurt that I felt in those moments, that grief, that pain, that sorrow over what this person was experiencing over, or maybe it reminded me of something as a kid that I experienced. I found that when I wore that emotion, I know it's a weird metaphor, but it made sense to me. So I'm offering it to you. But when I began to do that, it actually allowed me to be empathy in that moment. Because I wasn't the only one feeling it. It allowed me to to go into that moment of, of, of craziness and chaos and sadness and be one of them helping them through it. Which, if you think about it, is exactly what Jesus did to us. Turn the pain that you feel, the grief that you feel, the lament that you express, turn that into remembrance by expressing it, talking about it, talking to to others about it. People who are grieving with you are great with that. Talk to people about it who you just find that may have gone through a similar thing. Let that out. Tell that story. Remember it. Talk with God about it. Let him remember it. Tell it to him. Talk to yourself about it, which God counts as prayer too, by the way. I find a lot of my prayer can be talking to myself and it ends up talking to God in the end. If that's where you start, that's great. But letting it out is the best thing we can do. Even if you have to go to the bathroom and do it in the middle of a social gathering. I have done that before. No shame in that. If you have to go, you have to go, right? But like I said, I know that there is no way we can complete, we can process all of these things. Uh, so if you like to continue the discussion uh, on Facebook Live, whether you're here in person or online, uh, we can certainly continue that. But remember that Jesus did his best work in times of sorrow, in times of difficulty, in times of pain. He did his best work because he was one of us. And so when we're being human, That's the best thing we can be to show God to other humans too. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Our response to the word today is in your hymnal 375, verses 1 and 3 of There is a Balm.
There is a balm in Gilead indeed. And we don't get it unless we go to Gilead, to that place where we can find it. And the Holy Spirit can revive our souls and can help us through. The Bible presents Jesus' ministry as a go out and find them ministry, not as a come and find us ministry. God is out there looking for us and finding us, and so it's our job to do God's work and find others who need that healing too. As, different, as many people meet us and hear the gospel in new ways, thanks to your support as we've developed new ways to worship and minister to our faith, and as a United Methodist community of faith, we bring a unique message that doesn't always get a lot of attention in our world today, but has a lot to offer in its presentation of the gospel. And whether you continue to worship with us online or you worship with us in person or whether it depends on the week, you can still give your gifts to St. Paul's as we affirm God's love in new ways to new people. If you're here in person, you can drop your gift in the offering boxes, offering box located in the narthex or the offering plates around the sanctuary. And you can also go to supportstpauls.org right now and make your gift or pledge your continuing gifts to our church. Would you join me in prayer as we bless our offerings this morning? Holy God both calls us and confronts us. The gifts we bring to you are only a small part of the multitude we've received from your goodness. In the depth of our being, we know that in calling us, what you really seek is our faith, our belief, our conviction, our very hearts. And what we long from and what you long for from us is not a trip to church, but a lifelong journey into the world to follow Jesus with our whole being. Even when that being is a little unpredictable. Lord, forgive our unbelief. Forgive our desire to hold back unpleasant feelings, especially lamentation and grief, and lead us in the way that frees us from the grip of the world and into the way of life. In Christ we pray. Amen. As we end our worship today, thank you all for joining us and thank you, whether, thank you for tuning in online as well. Please go to our website or our social media pages uh, for news and announcements as well as our July mission offering, which we start co started collecting last week. We want to make sure that you're a part of it. We also want to uh, invite you to uh, the Peace by Peace ministry uh, meeting. They're having a meeting tomorrow at 10 a.m. And uh, they're going to have the principal of Fort McCoy K-8 school at the meeting. She's going to talk about uh, what you're giving the uh, July mission offering to. So whether you like sewing or not, I'm sure Arlene would love to have you show up and, um, and hear her, hear what she encounters there at the school and how best we can help. Uh, and it's, I'm really excited that uh, she was able to get that because uh, as we all, uh, you know, pull together, I think we can all agree that, you know, a smile can make a world of difference, whether it's us giving a smile to others or whether it's um, someone smiling back at us. And so we want to see a lot of smiles on some kids this school year. They have been through a lot. Um, pandemic or no pandemic, the kids at Fort McCoy do go through a lot, but especially now with technological uh, divides and that kind of thing. Uh, we want to make sure we give them a smile. And so I hope you'll participate in that uh, July offering. It's going to be taking, taken up between now and the 31st of July. We're going to collect it for the rest of the month. Uh, and so we hope you'll come in here uh, from the principal at Fort McCoy at the meeting and be a part of our July mission offering. Yes, I did it this time. <laughs> We're going it's highlighted. <laughs> it's what is highlighted. <laughs> Our closing hymn is 402, Lord, I Want to Be a Christian. If the Spirit so moves, you may rise and sing along. <laughs> Lord, I want to be a Christian in my heart, in my heart. Lord, I want to be a Christian in my heart, in my heart, in my heart. Lord, I want to be a Christian.
Christian in my heart. Lord, I want to be more loving in my heart, in my heart. Lord, I want to be more loving in my heart, in my heart, in my heart. Lord, I want to be more loving in my heart. Lord, I want to be like Jesus in my heart, in my heart, Lord, I want to be like Jesus in my heart, in my heart, in my heart, Lord, I want to be like Jesus in the benediction. May the precious Lord take your hand, lead us on, and help us stand when we can't do it ourselves, when we're tired, when we're weak, when we're worn. Through the storm, through the night, lead us on to the light. Take our hand, precious Lord, we lead you home. Eric. <laughs> this little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Everywhere I go, I'm gonna let it shine. Everywhere I go, I'm gonna let it shine. Everywhere I go, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. All through the night, I'm gonna let it shine all through the night. I'm gonna let it shine all through the night. I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine.